Then some guy says he knows Judaism, but there's no there's no Torah to five books and a parsha and there's no nothing. So, but the easiest way to do that is to have a certain system. Uh, you can't learn the whole five books in one day or one night. And even if you wanted to uh, split it up, the question is how. So the rabbis have split it up for us. What they did is they developed what is called the parsha of the week, and they took. Uh, the book of uh, the first book called Genesis Bracious, and they subdivide it into, uh, into I think, uh, 12 chapters, uh, 12 uh, parshas, 12 uh, uh, portions. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, there is a, uh, uh, the, the second book of the Torah comes, and that's subdivided into about uh, um, 11. And then comes Vayikra. And that's subdivided into about 10 or so. And then comes uh, Devarim, which is also subdivided. All together, it's 54 parshas. So then there was, uh, instead of having you know, 10 even for each, each book, 10 times 5 is 50, it comes out that... Um, so instead, what we have is we have an average 10, 10 parshas a book. Uh, which is about five times ten, fifty, and then a little bit of extra four and fifty-four parshas. The fifty-four parshas, however, have to be subdivided into uh, fifty weeks, because in the Jewish calendar is not fifty-two weeks; there's fifty weeks. Uh, the reason for that is because the Jewish calendar, as you know, is three hundred and fifty-four days, eleven days short of the regular calendar. The three hundred and fifty-four days. Uh, as, um, as the calendar that goes by the moon, as you all know, we go by the moon, uh, and we have a uh, a um, a um, <clears throat> every every twenty nine and a half days is uh, is a new moon, uh, twenty nine thirty days, something like that. Anyway, twelve of those makes a year, um, and that's how the Jewish calendar works. So therefore, obviously, Jewish uh, days begin at night. Uh, creation uh, and every day that God created something it was evening and it was morning first day second day third day whatever it was first evening first day morning so we all know that Shabbat begins on on Friday night and the Shabbat ends on Saturday night and everything all the holidays begin at night everything is night um, the night of course is important because in the night um, the moon shines, but not nearly as bright as the sun. Um, and the moon is really small in comparison. The rabbis teach in the early days of creation that God created two great, big, powerful lights, sun and the moon, and they were equal in power, um, which, of course, uh, uh, caused a little difficulty maybe to distinguish when, when it was nighttime or not. But anyway, it seems that the moon made a uh, made the suggestion that two kings can't operate under one crown uh, i mean someone's got to be the boss here there's no such thing as as as, uh, as a partnership when it comes to running the show uh there's got to be one who's a dominant partner and um uh and that's of course why we believe in the one god and whoever there whatever, whatever other assistance god dispatches the angels or whatever um and they're all um, subservient to hashem uh the suns and the moon and so the moon argued to hashem said look you created us both with equal power uh, somebody's got to be dominant so, so hashem said to the moon okay then you be the small guy and let the, the sun be the dominant power because you had your big mouth you opened your big mouth but, uh, but uh, the, the course, eventually, uh, we believe that with the coming of Mashiach and uh, the Messianic year in the world, that the moon and the sun will have equal power. Uh, however, that really does speak to the Jewish people, because the Jewish people are a people of, um, uh, of, of uh, smallness. We're, of course, obviously small in number, um, smaller than any other religious group. And our smallness is compensated for more than amply by our quality, uh, by our impact. Uh, we make more noise than, than the, the Islamics and the Christians put together when it comes to uh, the contributions to the world. Um, 
Uh, we, so therefore, we, re we relish the idea of being modest and small, and uh, we, we, we kind of take pride in that, in that sort of thing. Uh, in any event, so the, the Jewish calendar begins at night. The Jews go by the moon. The moon rotates around the earth 12 times. That's a full year, but each time it's a month. And that's how you have uh, the calendar that we have. The non-Jewish calendar uh, does not pay attention to months at all. In fact, all the months are just arbitrary. Every day they just make up their own months, their own days, and their own amounts and their own names. Doesn't make a difference. And so, so therefore, uh, they just go by the calendar year. The calendar year is 365 days, which goes by the sun by uh, and the Earth rotation around the sun one time. And they arbitrarily make up whatever months they want to do and how many days each month has. Again, it's arbitrary. Uh, with us, every month has the amount of days based upon when the new moon appears. It's not arbitrary at all. It's determined. <clears throat> In any event, um, and so throughout the year, we have 50 days, 50 weekends, 50 weeks, weekends, 50 Shabbos, Shabbatot, uh, rather than 52, which the regular, regular world has. But of these 50 that we have, um, we have to figure or, 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 or try to push into those 50, 54 uh, parishes. Um, and so somewhere along the lines, you've got to double up. But if let's say uh, a particular Shabbat coincides with a holiday, so everybody knows that the holiday has a special reading of its own. Uh, therefore, they will neglect, ignore the parish of the week and they will uh, 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 read something else. So this year, for instance, Pesach begins on a Friday night. That means Shabbat morning, Shabbos morning, we'll go to the shul. We will not read the regular scheduled programming, the regular scheduled parsha. We'll, we'll read something else dealing with the holiday of Pesach. If Shavuot, if that happens with Shavuot, we'll do the same thing. Uh, which means again, we're losing a couple of Shabbos in the, in the midst, uh, in the mix, and as such. Uh, we have to double up somewhere. In other words, we're going to have, we have too many parishes to cover and not enough weeks. And so, in many occasions, in many situations, we will, on certain occasions, um, double and read two parishes. This parish we have in front of us today, Vayakhel, often is connected with the next parish after with Pekude. And that becomes a double parish. Um, and this year that's not happening. The reason is because this year we have four extra Shab Shabbats. We have four extra Shabbats because we have an extra month. Because this year we have a leap year. Why do we have a leap year, an extra month? Because we have to catch up to this uh, to the sun calendar. Because the sun calendar does determine uh, seasons. And we have an obligation to make sure that Pesach happens in the spring. So if we were falling behind after three months, after three years, uh, 11 days each month, each year, I'm sorry, so we'd fall behind um, 354 days to 365, we'd fall behind every year 11 days. So those 11 days times three months, three years, would be 30 days, 33 days we're behind. After six years, we'd be, we'd be uh, 66 days behind and two months or whatever, and keep on falling behind and behind until Pesach no longer is in the spring, it's in, it's in the winter. And that can't happen. So every three years, we'll catch up. We're behind 30 days. We'll catch up with an extra month. And that's what we're doing right now in the month of Adar, the first of Adar, the first Adar of the two that appears this year. Um, Adar is the month of uh, Purim. Purim celebration. And the Purim celebration is quite uh, exciting, quite extensive. It's a, a time for, um, for le levity and, and, and laughing and, 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 and uh, joy and happiness and singing and dancing and drinking. And it's a great, great celebration. Um, it's the, probably the most celebratory day of the year for the Jewish people. Purim <clears throat> represents the destruction of the evil Haman and his plans to annihilate us, the, 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 the possibility of a Holocaust. And um, Purim uh, is therefore celebrated in, in, a, uh, in a, uh, an extraordinary manner. Uh, but when you have two Adars, to my great disappointment, you don't have two Purims. 
I would have liked two Purims personally, but uh, it's not to be. So the question is, which Purim, which Adar do you celebrate Purim? In the first or the second? The second. The second. And the rabbis question it. The rabbis say, I mean, truth be told, we have a, a ruling called, you never, never delay mitzvahs. Delaying a mitzvah displays um, a, a, not a contempt for the mitzvah, but a disregard for the mitzvah. It's not important. I'm, I'm busy. I ain't got time. Uh, I got to do this. I'll come back to the mitzvah. And um, we're told not to do that. We're told the person has a mitzvah to do. Run to it. The Jesus, uh, zeal and, 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 and enthusiasm and energy. And then not uh, and be preoccupied or distracted by other stuff. Person gets up in the morning, he shouldn't be looking at his, at his business first and then daven. He should daven first. Right? Pray to Hashem. And then take care of whatever else you have to do. Make sure that you do your mitzvahs first. If you have a baby boy to have a circumcision, a bris, make sure that's in the morning. Uh, having a, uh, an event, whatever it is, opinion, event, or whatever, unless there is a special reason why you need to delay it, it should not be delayed. Uh, so why, if that's the case, do we delay the celebration of Purim? Why do we push you up to the second Adar? Why don't we, delay, why don't we celebrate Adar? Why don't we celebrate Purim in this Adar? And then next Adar, we'll have a plain Adar. It'll be, well, we'll need an extra month, but it's a leap year. And, we'll, and then we'll go into Pesach. And it's a great question. It really pushes off uh, the mitzvah. It's not the right thing to do. So the rabbis answer. The rabbis say, there is a concept of connecting geula to geula. You should always connect redemption to redemption. The redemption of Purim should be connected to the redemption of Pesach. And of course, if that's the case, the Adar would celebrate Purim on the 14th and 15th. A month later, which would be the first month of the year, Nisan would celebrate on the 15th Pesach, and they'd be 30 days apart. And that's a beautiful thing. If we celebrated Purim this Adar, then we'd be 60 days apart, because we'd have to wait a whole extra month. And therefore, it is appropriate to delay simply in order to connect conceptually, connect conceptually with the idea that there is a that that, um, uh, that Purim uh, and Pesach convey the same message, the message of redemption, of Geula. The concept of redemption, however, must be understood because redemption, everyone's clamoring for Mashiach, everyone's clamoring for a better world, everyone's clamoring for the, the get rid of all the garbage that we see outside in the, in the outside world. It would want to, to eliminate all the violence that we have and all the, all the other miseries that and, and mental illnesses and drugs and whatever else is going on in the world. We want to get the world to be better. Of course, we, in an, in an isolation, we'll make our own personal world better, but we'd like to see the whole world better. We are a universal a universal thinking people. We don't just think for ourselves. We think we want to better the world. Uh, so we'd like Mashiach to come and make it better. We like redemption. So um, the redemption concept is a concept no different than other concepts that it sometimes lies in the air. There's a certain vibe that you get. Maybe in a certain place, like in a shul, vis-a-vis uh, a park, a certain vibe that you get on a time, such as Shabbos, vis-a-vis -vis Tuesday and Thursday. There's a certain vibe that pervades the air. Um, and the vibe that pervades the air uh, is developed, maybe historically, so that if the historical impact is powerful, it'll continue on annually, year after year after year, at that very same time. Now, for instance, Purim is a joyous time. So we all know that, therefore, since it was so joyous then, in Shushan, when the Jews were redeemed from, uh, from the evil Haman, so it'll be that way in that very same day, annually. Every year we come across this other date of the 14th and 15th, we're going to feel in the air a certain level of joy, a certain level of redemption. We're going to feel it. 
Uh, it's just historically, you know, as as the the, the globe turns and and then and, and the world continues, there's always a. It's it's not just a new a, a new thing. It's a renewal, and the renewal idea is the idea that whatever happened then is going to happen again at this particular time. So therefore, if let's say you have a court case, uh, a good idea is to delay the court case for the month of Adar, because you have more, it's a happier time, it's more mazel, it's more good fortune during this month. Of course, on the other hand, the exact polar opposite is the month of Av, the month of the, the destruction of the temple. And that's a month of sadness and tragedy, which reoccurs every year every single year and when it reoccurs again you know it's it's the kind of thing which which the harshness and and and, and god with violence who knows what else it just pervades the, the the atmosphere if you've got to go to court that's not the time to do it if you have a surgery to do try to put it off if you have a surgery to do do it during this month not during that month uh that month is a calamity month for the Jewish people. Someone called me up the other day and asked me, is it appropriate to fly on an airplane during the nine days? Of course, the question is, uh, is it appropriate to fly on an airplane? I mean, the airplane maybe is dangerous. Of course, we all know that, thank God, the airplanes uh, are relatively safe. Of course, uh, every God forbid, once in a while, you'll, you'll hear of a tragedy. Uh, but maybe it might not be a good idea to fly during the nine days leading up to Tisha B'Av in the month of Av. Might not be a good idea. In general, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I would take a hike then or, uh, or go on a vacation then or, or, or other things that, might, that could, be, uh, could be dangerous in some way or another. Uh, I've got to exercise caution. And this is a month that is filled with, with heaviness and, and sadness and so forth. The month of Nisan is the month of Geula of redemption. That means to say that since Nisan provided the joyous uh, redemption of our people, that our people were redeemed on Pesach uh, from its Ryan way back when, every single time this month and this holiday reoccurs, the possibility of a subsequent redemption is therefore apparent, which simply means Benisa Nigalo, Benisa Natidim Nigoyal. Who knows when Mashiach will come, but he's apt to come in the month of Nisan, in the month of Mashiach, in the month of redemption, in the month when the Jews were freed from Egypt. That's the month, maybe, that he, he, might, he might be coming. And so, therefore, uh, with all this uh, sense of awareness, uh, we realize. But we want to connect redemption to redemption. We want to just create an atmosphere of redemption, not just in the month of Pesach, but in the month of Purim as well, just before it. And uh, in this month, we are having, and we are establishing a sense of, of, uh, of, of anticipation for redemption. So how do we anticipate redemption? What do we need to do? So basically, what we need to do is the following. We need to Understand that on Purim, one of the most extremely exciting events is the idea of giving gifts to the poor and gifts to your friends. Now, gifts to the poor, I understand. That's the concept of compassion, generosity. But what are these gifts to the friends all about? What is this, the Jewish trick or treat? I mean, what are we doing here? The answer is huh? promoting friendship. The answer is promoting brotherhood, togetherness. Now, you have a Purim Suda, you invite people. The idea is, is that Pesach, we say, we have a passage in the Haggadah, it just begins the Haggadah, the Seder on Pesach night. As we're beginning the Seder, we're reading the Haggadah, we say, all who are in need, please come and join us. And we generally do, that's what we do. We invite people to the Pesach Seder. Once again, these Seder holidays are celebrated with unity, with friendship, with outgoing togetherness, with a sense of grouping, with a sense of nationhood, with a sense of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of our people. It's a beautiful thing. And that is what redemption is all about.
The destruction of the Beis Hamikdash on Tisha B'Av two thousand years ago came because of the sin of Bashan Hara, huh? Okay, all kinds of sinat chinam. Sinas. People fought over something. People hated each other for something. Now, what did they fight over? Chinam. What's sinat chinam? Nothing. Stupid, right? Valueless, nonsense, garbage. When you hurt me, I hurt you. Ba ba ba. Here's a punch in the nose. I mean, <laughs> now of course Jews aren't that prone to violence with one another. Uh, it's not one of our, our traits, thank God. When I went to uh, to visit the, I was doing some chaplaincy work in the prisons. I found uh, very few Jews in the maximum. I found a whole lot of Jews in the minimum. All the white collar crimes, you know, all that cheated here and cheated there. <laughs> Tragically, Jews do that. Uh, we, I mean, we honestly admit what we do and what we don't do. And we're, you know, um, and so the, I mean, yes, we, we Jews uh, do have this problem of not getting along. And then and, and, uh, that's a big problem. We, we, we got to learn how to stop that because that's what caused the destruction. That's what caused the exile. That's what kicked us out of our land. That's what made us suffer persecution. Because we didn't get along with one another. We fought, we argued. And you would think, I mean, don't we know better? And we do. But we still act silly and foolish. Someone was telling me the other day that they... Uh, so a lot of people in shul, uh, and tragically, people talk during shul, which is kind of sad. And then a lot of times they talk lush and horror about one another. Of course, the best juiciest lush and horror is about the rabbi. But that speech was horrible. That was, that was terrible. <laughs> right? <laughs> but whatever it is, <laughs> the point is, is that we are, and, and, and someone justified it. Welcome to the from world. This is where we gossip. I beg your pardon? That's what from people do. They gossip. Wacko, wacko. That's not what we do. That's what you do, maybe. So you have to understand that this essence of our peoplehood is a peoplehood. We're not individuals. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. Now, I know people and families do fight. I know brothers and sisters get into it every once in a while, and mothers and, 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 and fathers and children, and, you know, and this kind of disagreement, that kind of disagreement. Of course, uh, the spousal disagreement is kind of fun, kind of funny, and the husband and the wife are fighting over what? Over nonsense, over silliness. Well, you insulted me. You insulted me. <laughs> oh, a bunch of crazy nonsense, one after the other. We have to learn how to overlook all that stuff because I have a greater goal. The greater goal is unity. The greater goal of unity does what? Brings all of us into a better life. Brings us all into a redemptive life. Brings us all back home to Israel. Brings us all to a better world. If we're getting along at home, we're contributing to the world at large getting along. Now, there's a war going on in Russia and Ukraine, all that stuff, right? Insanity. I mean, war, war. What a crazy killing each other. Was that some people? Are, people are, are, are mentally the, 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 the deranged. But that's the idea of a world that lives in in fragmentation and friction. That's the idea of a of a world that that that, that uh, fights. I mean, in the mid part of the twentieth century, uh, the the horror of living on this planet. I mean, I wonder if anybody found a refuge anywhere in the planet. Maybe unless they went up to, uh, to, to some, uh, <laughs> some empty uh, cottage in the middle of the woods somewhere. Everyone's affected by a whole world of war, world war, sanity. This country, that country. Of course, the Jews are the most persecuted of all. Because we have within our hands the ability to change the world. We have to become better people towards each other. And in so doing, we can bring back the third sanctuary, the, the third base of the temple, and bring back, bring us home to, to the land of Israel.
So therefore, we're going to take the holiday of Purim and connect it to the holiday of Pesach within 30 days of each other from 15th of Adar to the 15th of Nisan, 14th of Adar to the 14th of Nisan, and set up a whole system of nearly two months of efforts towards re-strengthening our relationships and getting focused and conscious of the opportunity for redemption. And that's why we delay the mitzvah of Purim for that reason. And you, and you can see that that's a powerful idea. Now, <clears throat> uh, to get it, I want to elaborate on the idea for just a moment, but before I do, just want to get back to the idea that since we have an extra month, we are able, therefore, not to have to combine parshas. So this parsha of Ayakel, usually combined with Pekude right after it, is separated this month. Very fine. Uh, last week, we read about Kitisa, and we read about the tragedy of the Golden Calf, uh, which also brought about a great lot of disunity. But in the parsha, there was this reference to uh, the Mishkan again, Reference to Betzalel and his contribution as the architect. Reference to the need to, to have a washing basin for, for people who are going to the coin to do the service needed to, to cleanse himself and so forth. A reference to the giving of the half shekel as an obligatory tax to, to, to fund and, uh, and support the Mishkan, the temple. And whether it was the mobile one that was in the desert to the permanent structure in Jerusalem to the small mini replicas we have today in our synagogues. Um, all this was discussed. Of course, the details of the vessels in the sanctuary, uh, of course, uh, uh, needed to be discussed as well, including uh, the, the, uh, the various vessels uh, that we discussed two parishes two weeks before last week. So we had the, we had Truma, then Tetzave, then Kitisa last week, Bayakil this week, and Bakude at the end, which these last five portions of the second book of the Torah deal exclusively, almost exclusively, with the issue of the building of the sanctuary, which of course led to the permanent structure in Jerusalem, which of course was destroyed because of hatred, which of course will only be rebuilt when we change our, our mode of behavior. The details of, 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 of all these uh, uh, vessels in the temple, uh, therefore, the, uh, are, uh, are extensively discussed. But this parasha we have in front of us this week is almost repetitive. In terms of exactly what was discussed two or three weeks ago, it's being discussed again with the same details. Uh, of course, you might argue, why would the, why would the Torah do that? And uh, the idea is that... Um, th that the, the very sense of um, of of the uh, uh, of, of this repetition is to emphasize the centrality that it has in Jewish life. That means that to be a real Jew living in Israel in the biblical times meant that you had as a focal point the base of Eitzah. You had, you know, uh, you, you knew that within your midst there was a base of Nikdash, there was a holy temple in Yushalayim on Haram Oriyah. And you made it as often as often as often as you could, at least three times a year, for the three holidays of pilgrimage festivals of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And of course, when you got there, you were anxious to watch the royalty and the, 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 the beauty of, 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 of what was going on and the sense of, uh, wow. Is the Kohanim doing that stuff and that stuff, and the Levim are doing that stuff? Because we're in the, we're bystanders, and we're out there in the in the uh, in, in the courtyard and watching and 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 and, and uh, learning and and just you know it's a you, you can get get all caught up in the joy of it all just by watching. I mean, uh, Fifty thousand people go to Dodger Stadium and get all excited about, about the baseball game. You know, fifty thousand people can come to the base of Mikdash and Shalayim. You get all excited watching what the Kohen does to bring a sacrifice, watching what the lady does in terms of the songs that they sing and the help that they provide for the Kohanim. And the whole, the whole royalty of it all is just absolutely magnificent. And when you're not a Kohen or not a lady, but you're there just as a, not, not even as a participant, but as a, as, a, as a spectator and you're watching it, 
it, it, it's a contact high. Because in the in the ball game when the guy hits the home runs and everyone's an uproar in the stands, people are screaming and yelling, hey, right? As if it's even it means a whole lot to them. I mean, this guy just paid 50 bucks, you understand, to sit in a good seat to watch some other guy hit a home run and he's all screaming and elated and he's having a grand time. Meanwhile, he's making money on your 50 bucks. So who's the smart guy who's the dummy? Right? <laughs> but obviously, people do get a charge out of Maybe watching something that's a really a heroic activity. Well, you can't get more heroic than what the Kohen and the Levi do in the in the uh, in the in the temple in Yerushalayim. You can't get more than that. And um, all that, and all that beauty, and all that grandeur is missing today with the destruction of the temple two thousand years ago and the sending of us into exile. Uh, we are missing a lot. Now you come to Shul Shabbos morning and. Uh, you see a beautiful shul, and you see the Torah, and you see the, 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 the way it's structured in the prayer books, and you watch the service, and the service is beautiful, and the chazan sings, and you all sing along, and it's just beautiful just to be part of that, right? Can you imagine that this is like one-tenth of what it used to be like? So for as rich as you think Judaism is, it's one-tenth. No, I won't say it's one thing. Let's say it's just uh, less than half of what it once was and what it can be again. Uh, it makes you really feel like what, a, what, what an, an awesome thing to be, to be Jewish and to be a Jew. Uh, but again, all this is dependent upon the, 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 the sense of, of, of uh, 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 rebuilding this with the proper mindset of, of human interaction that we, we talked about. And so... This parasha will just repeat the idea of what was mentioned two weeks or three weeks ago. And in its repetition, it will simply impact you with one thought only. And that thought is, you know what was discussed before that God said, how have you done? They're doing it here. So what was discussed in Truma as what needs to be done and what God wants to be done in the temple is discussed here as it's being done. And the same thing with Parsh de Tzave, as vis a vis Parsh de and it's getting it done over there as well. You can sit in the high chair if you want. <laughs> oh, you know, over here, you got it over there. You got it over there. So, so um, this is really the essence of this week's Parsha. Um, however, I wanted to bring to your attention the fact that there are times, as I said, that a Shabbat will pass. And we won't read the parish of the week. Why won't we? Because it'll coincide with a holiday and we'll have to read the, whatever is event, uh, event of the holiday is. Um, but then there is another interesting phenomenon that occurs in this month of Adar. And it really won't occur in this month of Adar, but in the following Adar, which is coming up next week. In other words, this week, we're going to say the blessing for Rosh Chodesh. The new month will occur uh, sometime next week. Uh, anybody know? I don't know myself. Uh, Rosh Chodesh should be actually in Shul. That's an interesting thing that if you don't know, don't go to Shul and the Shul will announce exactly what day Rosh Chodesh is going to be next week. That's the job of the of the Shabbos before Rosh Chodesh. It's called the Shabbos of uh, of blessing of the new month. It's interesting that of course Rosh Chodesh has always become a tra a traditionally uh, a special holiday for women. Of course, women. Uh, have a certain sense of, uh, of that monthly cycle, which the moon has, which they identify with, in which women uh, have that certain sense of renewal and, uh, and rebirth, so to speak. And frankly, that's why they are told, women are told to observe Rosh Chodesh even more than men. Uh, that means that while Rosh Chodesh is not a real holiday, we have to stay home from work, but women are told that they should make every effort to do less work than usual, which means your husband should cook your dinner at the very least. And don't bother with laundry either. So <laughs> and get a maid. <laughs> Basically, some effort should be made. It's not really determined or governed, but some effort should be made by women uh, throughout the Jewish community to do something personal for themselves um, on Rosh Chodesh. Maybe I didn't think you have to dinner or something. But I think also it's an, an interesting that, that uh, in recent years, uh, women's groups have emerged 
uh, within various communities to celebrate Rosh Chodesh for women only. And, and it's a beautiful thing. Oftentimes, lectures uh, sponsored by the by the community would would feature a special uh, would feature a special, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, a, a lecture by maybe a rabbi uh, rather than a rabbi and so forth. And I think that, that that's really beautiful stuff. So we're going to bench, we're going to bless Rosh Chodesh, and that's why women are especially uh, turned on and tuned in to, uh, to um, um, uh, observing Rosh Chodesh uh, and, uh, and tuned in to coming to Shul, going to Shul this particular Shabbos. This particular Shabbos, this particular Shabbos, uh, we, uh, women will go to Shul, will make an effort, a special effort to go to Shul, simply to hear the blessing and the announcing of the new month. And the new month, of course, is Adar Bet, the second Adar. Uh, and Rosh Chodesh should be on a week from today. Am I right? Anybody? March 4th. Huh? Ne next Thursday? March 4th. I'm not sure what day. Oh, well, today's the, today's the 20th. 24th. Tonight, what? Okay, so th today's the 23rd. The next Thursday is the 30th. Correct? What? Uh, you got the wrong month. Correct. The, 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 the January, next Thursday. Anyway, February and March, the role in our lives. You understand? I mean, I know you got to write a check. I mean, if I wrote a check, odds are such and such, I, I'm sure the bank would cash my check, 5782, you know. Well, my, my tax return, right. <laughs> That'd be a good one. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the pull in a chair from my shoe, from my office. Uh, but, but, the, the, um, but clearly, the, the, uh, uh, the, the month of Adar, which is what we're concerned about, uh, today was the 23rd. That means next Thursday is the 30th, which means that next Thursday is Rosh Chodesh. Uh, next Thursday is Rosh Chodesh. Uh, we also have two days Rosh Chodesh this year, next Thursday and next uh, and, and next Friday. So we have two days Rosh Chodesh coming up next week. We'll announce it this Shabbos. <clears throat> and so uh, now we come to a phenomena. And the phenomena is, is that during the month of Adar, four special Shabbat observances will occur in which we read not the Parsha of the week. I mean, we'll read the Parsha of the week, of course. We will not replace the Parsha of the week, I mean. We'll read the Parsha. But we will add a special, additional, shorter reading from a second Torah. So that this Shabbos, when you go to shul, if you see, if you go early enough to watch the Torah being taken out, you'll see that will take out two Torahs. One for the Parsha, and one for the extra special reading. Uh, and we'll do this during this month four times. And this is the only time of the year we do it. These are called the four special parshas, the four special Shabbos in which is an additional smaller reading from a second Torah um, that, 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 in, that, that will be in addition to the parsha. Now the parsha, as you know, has seven men that are called up for the, for the Torah. Those seven are called aliyos. What's an aliyah? Going up, ascending. So therefore, you're ascending up and you're going up to the to the to the uh, to the Torah. It's a big honor. And you're called up by your name, and of course, the coin goes first, and Levi, and then everybody else. And uh, there are seven such uh, people called up. That's the max, uh, generally speaking. The day that um, holiday. Yom Tif, which of course is not as great as Shabbat, has only five men called up. Uh, the weekday has, Mondays and Thursdays, for instance, has three men called up. It's simple. It's not a, a distinguished day. But on Rosh Chodesh, whatever day Rosh Chodesh may occur in the week, maybe Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, doesn't matter. There's going to be a Torah reading and there's going to be four people. Now, the holiday we said is five. But you know that there are certain holidays like Pesach and Sukkot that are large holidays, seven days each. During these seven or eight days here in America, we have middle days that are not really holidays. 
They're called semi-holidays, and they're called cholamoy. During cholamoy, we will call up four people, just like we call up on Rosh Chodesh, four people. And then a regular holiday, the first two days, last two days, whatever, is five people. Yom Kippur, we call up six. In a certain sense, it's not quite Shabbat. One of the things missing in Yom Kippur is you can't eat. One of the beautiful things of Shabbat is the meals. And so there is a certain thing about Yom Kippur, mind you, as powerful as it is, there's a little lesson Shabbat, which teaches you a great lesson about how powerful and how important Shabbat is. Now, I know in Israel, for instance, the Israelis, they're real, real heavy about Yom Kippur. You can't find a car in the street. You can't find a car in the street in Yom Kippur. Anywhere. Maybe unless it's uh, some, some crazy, uh, right? But the Israelis say, I'm Yom Kippur, you know? But if it's Shabbat, cars are all over the place. Everyone's driving. And guess what? In a certain sense, Shabbat is higher than Yom Kippur. That's wild, if you think about it. But then it's, it's, it's a misplaced value of what really the people just don't know. And they get some sort of tradition handed down, which oftentimes is quite uh, erroneous. Anyway, Yom Kippur is six days, six people called up, Shabbat is seven. But after the reading is over and the seven people, let's say, on every Shabbat are, are finished, the chazan, or the reader of the Torah, will go back to the last three verses of the parsha and read it over again for an additional man to be called up. That additional man is called Maftir, Tavtor. Why is that so? Because he's going to read from the book of the prophets. That means after we finish the Torah reading, we read the book of the prophets. Not the whole book, maybe chapters, you know, and then we go on to Muslim and finish up. Uh, why do we read the, a, a chapter of the prophets? There was a time in history when, uh, when Jews were not allowed to read the Torah in various persecuted countries. It was considered treason against the government. So what we did instead is we read from the book of the prophets and no one bothered us. Once we established that, we never lost that custom because we wanted to remember what persecution was like. But if you called up an eighth person to read the Haftorah only and not reread a little bit of the Parsha, it would almost make Haftorah reading equal to the Parsha. And that's wrong. The Parsha is the Torah. The Haftorah is the prophets. Everybody knows Torah is number one. Prophets is two. Writings is three. The Tanakh which is Torah, Nevi'im, Kshuvim, is made up of the first five books, which is the primary essence of God's revelation to us. There is no laws learned out of prophets. The prophet lessons are teachings and moral maxims and teach great lessons, but Dora law, mitzvahs, 613, is contained within the five books of Moses. And so this person will come up to read the Aftar to remember the meaning of persecution, to remember the cause of persecution, and he will read the last three passages of the parasha to show that Torah remains primary. Anyway, that's the way it goes. In these four special parshas and four special weekends and Shabbats of the month of Adar, we read four special additional parshas to the parasha, and they replace the mafter. And they're read from a separate Torah. And so if let's say the reading is over and the seven people have been called up, so then uh, we all know we, we pick up the Torah right, and then show it to the congregation. And then we sit down and tie it up. And rather than beginning the prophet, prophetic reading, we will go and read a second part, a second little edition. And that second little edition will be from the second Torah. And these are the four editions. The first one is called Shkolem, all about the half shekel. Now, if that sounds familiar to you because of last week, it is. <laughs> we, we're going to repeat last week's Parsha, not the whole Parsha, of course, last week, but the little bit of last week's Parsha, uh, this Shabbos, uh, as a prelude to the month of Adar. We do that because since the half shekel is a tax imposed upon everybody, 
And in fact, we had tax collectors going out and asking for it. And again, half hey, is not a lot of money. But the rich can't give more and the poor can't give less because we want unity. And so therefore, um, and everybody's got to participate. There's no exceptions. Um, and so therefore, uh, the time to collect this tax is now. In the historical times, there were tax collectors going around all throughout the countryside of Israel collecting this tax. And collecting this tax, all this money would go to the upkeep and the support of the Temple, temple in Yushalayim and of the sacrifice that would be bought, the animals that needed to be brought for them and, and bought with, with money for the coming year. Now's the time to start thinking about making our contributions to the shul. Now's the time to start thinking about making our contributions to the upkeep of the temple in Yushalayim and to the purchase of animals for sacrifices that will cover the entire year's gamut of sacrifices. Now it's your year of annual membership. Let's put it that way, simply. So I, I'm, I'm telling you what's historical and giving you an idea of how you might implement this history in, uh, in, in, in current times. Uh, yes? Is this only for this hour because it's, um, it's a leap year or is it? Every, every year, every year. Uh, the, the, if it were not a leap year and we were, let's say, going from last month of Shvat into just a regular Adar, then we'd be reading this reading on the last Shabbos of Shvat as an entrance into Adar. This time we're reading it in the last Shabbos of Adar 1 as an entrance into Adar 2. Nearly basically the same thing, except the extra month. And uh, this is the time, and one of the customs we, we, we might do on Purim to remember this is uh, we have a plate um, uh, out there displayed on the, on the beam of every shul on the night of Purim when you come in. And uh, basically, you're supposed to come in with a half a dollar, which is the half coin of our realm, of our country. And if you live in France, it's half a franc or whatever. Uh, and in Spain, it's a half a peso or a euro, whatever it is, right? Uh, Mexico's got pesos, right? Mexico's got pesos, okay, half a peso. It's probably worth a dime. <laughs> what, what's half a peso worth? Anyway, so... so um, Point is, is that um, is that what we would do is we'd come into shul uh, with a dollar and a half in our pocket, and uh, hopefully three fifty cent pieces. And the reason for that is because we do the half shekel three times because it meant, it's mentioned it three times in the parsha last week. And so um, we will pick up uh, 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 the three coins, hold them up, uh, and use them as a contribution to the shul on Purim night or Purim day. And that's what we do when the plates are displayed out there and everyone participates. Uh, so how would the reading go for tomorrow, for the Shabbos? Very simple. Follow me on three, on nine, on 516, sorry. 516 is the beginning of Parsha by Yaakel. And we'll read the Parsha. Uh, pretty, pretty extensive and pretty um, de detailed with all the de all the um, work and all the uh, activities. And uh, we'll go on to 522, 524, 526, 528, and we're done. At the time that we're done with this reading at 528, the, uh, someone will be called up to be honored with the raising, raising of the Torah. He'll raise the Torah up. And he'll sit down with it. Everyone will take a look at it, honor the Torah. Everyone will stand. And then you know, the, the, someone will be uh, honored to close the Torah. And a new Torah comes up. When, hold on a second. When the new Torah comes up, the second Torah. So then um, we'll double back to last week's parsha, which is um, on page 484. And we'll read that one section of last week's parsha this week. And that's called Shkola, all about the half shekel. Now, last week's parsha, this last week's parsha is big. We're just going to read this one little page of it. That's it. Won't take three minutes. But that's the additional thing. Now, when we take the Torah out on Shabbat morning, we take the Torah out, right? Someone opens the ark. Unless someone takes the Torah in his hand, Shema Yisrael, whatever. And uh, if we're taking out two, we're going to take out two at the same time. 
So someone else is on it, holding the other Torah. So you got two people holding the Torah, and we're all saying Shema Yisrael. And then when the first person comes around and people kiss the Torah, and then he'll go up here to put the Torah down, the other Torah uh, will be held by the man who takes it out and sit right down over there, and he'll hold that Torah throughout the entire reading. And while he's doing that, he'll look at the commission, follow the reading, as it's going on. Once this reading is done, the seven weeks, the seven aliyahs, the seven portions of our Parsha, so then it's finished. It will be uh, held high. A person will sit down with it. And then a second person with the second Torah comes up and puts it down here for the second reading. This will occur next month four times. And this is the first one this weekend. That's called Shkolet. And where do we find Shkolet? A Parsha back from where we are right now. So we just double back a little bit and read this one little spot of it, and we're done. So Parsha's Vayakhel added to it the beginning of last week's Kitisa, which talks about Shkolem, and that's the first of the four special Parshas. Now, in the middle of the month of Adar, we'll call Purim. On the Shabbos before Purim, we'll add another one. Another addendum, another after the seven alias of the parsha week, another small little addendum to the reading from the second Sefer Torah. That's on the Shabbos before Purim. And it will talk about the need to remember the evil of Amalek. Why are we doing that at that particular time? Because Haman, the evil, was from Amalek. And therefore, you need to know. Um, uh, and, and we need to remember annually the evil of Amalek, which raises its ugly head in every generation, including the time of Purim, including in our own time over the last, uh, last century. And we're with the Nazis and the Germans. And so, um, and so that particular extra portion is found way over in the book of Devarim, the fifth book of the Torah, and it's found uh, on page, at the very end of Parshat Kisetze, which is found on page 1066. So two weeks from now, we'll read this 1066. Now, it's not in, the, it's not in the order of the parsha, obviously. It's all skipping all the way to the fifth book. But we do so because of the event of Amalek, because of the event of Purim, because of the event of the evil of Purim, Haman, who came from Amalek. And it says, remember the evil that Amalek has done to you when I left the triumph. They came after you. They laid ambush to you. They, they, they tried to weaken you. And you were weak and defenseless. And you weren't fearing Hashem at the time. And Hashem stood there for us and saved us from him. Therefore, when there will come a time when we will be free of all enemies and go home to Israel, and inherit the land, we will have an obligation to destroy the entire nation of Amalek, men, women, and children. The evil of such a nation cannot be allowed to continue on this earth. And that evil, of course, pervades to this very day. And um, that evil is an evil which is actually, uh, uh, it does carry over to the genes, no question about it. Um, can a person who's born into the Amalek evil emerge and become a decent human being? Well, yes, he could. The Gemara 2,000 years ago predicted that there's one aspect of Amalek that you got to be really, really scared of. One particular nation that is the scariest of them all with the potential of the greatest danger. And the Gemara calls it Germamia. Germania, Germany. 2,000 years ago, it was predicted the evil of Germany. Um, are they good Germans? Maybe I could find one somewhere. I don't know. Maybe one over there, maybe one over there, isolated. I don't know. <laughs> of course, on the other hand, um, there were some good Germans that risked their lives to help Jews. Maybe you can count them on the fingers of your hand. Most of the nation was swept up into a frenzy 
And you wonder, if you lived in that time, and you were a German, what would you do? And they told you to hate Jews and beat Jews and destroy Jewish businesses and break their stores and, and uh, beat them up and harm them and hurt them and disallow them to go to school and stuff like that. Would you, would you be complicit with that? Uh, would I be complicit with that? Would, would I do that? And of course, the, uh, the answer is that in many cases, uh, most Germans did. Of course, you say, well, I was only following orders, you know. I told you to follow orders. I told you to follow orders. If America, if I live in America, and America gives me an order like that, I'm going to listen to America, I'm going to listen to the president. I'm going to listen to the idiotic president. What, am I crazy? The president of the country tells you to, to, to be prejudiced against such people, or, or any people. You're going, to, you're going to be crazy enough to listen to such an idiot? Because we don't want to discuss the uh, IQ of the president, uh, uh, the chief in uh, the chief commander or whatever is called up there in the White House. But <laughs> in any event, um, the point is, is that Amalek is an important nation to remember, to, um, uh, that we have a commitment to destroy them. And um, we annually remember this every year before Purim, in the middle of the month of Adar. Now, there are two other readings, I'm not going to cover them now, but that do the same thing that don't displace or replace the parsha, but simply small addendums to the parsha. You can see this one over here on 1066 is only three sentences. That's the smallest reading of the year, if you think about it. Um, we have a minimum of readings that allow all for a minimum of only three passages. You can't ever read a parsha less than three passages. So three is there's the minimum, and that's the bare minimum right then and there. Uh, so it doesn't take much. It takes maybe a minute to read it. But it needs another Sefer Torah. And it's an addendum to the regular Parsha of the week. And that's what we have this week. So let's go back to Parsha's Yakel, our Parsha, and talk about a little bit of the ideas of the Mishkan once again, realizing that the Shabbos is very special. Number one, you'll have a second Sefer Torah for Shkolim, for the half shekel tax. Number two, you will have a special blessing that the Chazal will, will recite, holding the Torah, uh, um, to bless the new moon, the month of, of Adar, coming up next Thursday and Friday, and it'll be blessed uh, uh, this Shabbos, uh, this uh, this uh, Shabbos morning in in the in the show. You know, you must be a genius. You know how many people have asked that question. You know that question was even asked in the Talmud. You know that question was even asked amongst the Shulchan Aruch and Halakha? Great question. So you're out the answer. <laughs> Maybe if I'm in a good mood, I'll tell you the answer at the end of the class. <laughs> Unless anybody wants to figure it out. Anybody? Think about it. You know, think about it. If you get the, get the answer right, you get 50 bucks. Anyway, <laughs> special prize. Anyway, the point is, is that... Um, is that uh, uh, you have a um, uh, the, this extra special reading, and uh, and that's what we do this particular Shabbos. Um, Parshas Vayakel. What's the word Vayakel mean? First word in the Parsha. Moses assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel. Now I don't know how he did it, but he got everybody together. Probably. Crowded together. I mean, and, and talking about you know, having uh, crowd control. I mean, uh, people bumping against each other and jumping all over the place. And I mean, I, I mean, we have Bar Hashem a nice crowd every uh, Thursday, every Sunday. Nice, nice group of people coming on us and that. I mean, would I be happier if it was an overflow crowd? Certainly, I would. Would I uh, like to see more, more, more chairs and more people? Obviously, right? Um, and most of it's everybody together. Now, of course, Moshe was a better teacher than I, so therefore he, he was able to do it. Uh, but Moshe Rabbeinu also had the kind of authority that when he said, let's gather together, you didn't say, I'm busy. You didn't say, I can't make it tonight. You didn't say, uh, well, I have to stay home and, uh, and prepare for Shabbos. Uh, you didn't say, uh, let's have, uh, 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 I have a, a, a date tonight. You, know, you didn't say that. My Shabbat says, you come, you come. You understand the authority and the power of a leader. 
And that really is a valuable lesson. What's the lesson? The lesson is that sooner or later, every one of us needs to find our own personal Moshe Rabbein, in which we become submissive to his teachings, in which we become um, uh, willing, not willing, but obligated to listen to what he teaches us, what he tells us, think when we ask a question. And imagine the futility of a person going to a rabbi and asking the question, the rabbi answers, and he goes, about something else. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I waste everybody's time. Point of listening to a Rebbe is the point of having someone in your life that gives you direction. See, one of us has a personal doctor, I hope. You go to a doctor, you have a relationship, he teaches you, he knows you over what your past is, what this, what that, and he helps you, you know, gives you the right medicine. He knows what's just right for you, right for all his patients. And so your Rebbe, if you appoint him as such, and that's your elective choice, of course, whoever you may choose, uh, he knows who you are, what you're up, what you're made up of, and he knows you well enough, and you shared a lot together, he knows you, and, and he's the one you should be asking your questions to. And frankly, you should be listening to. And that is an essence of what we call the transmission of the, of the tradition. Being able to have a Rebbe in your life is as important as a doctor. It, with you, make yourself a Rebbe. It's a mission for Kevot. Just look it up right there, black and white. I didn't make it up, right? Um, now, the idea of doing so is uh, really important because if you lend your, if you if if you if you fend for yourself, um, you'll either be uh, um, um, uh, you'll either be uh, not attentive to issues and questions, and you just let them go by. Or you'll just make your own decisions and most likely 50% of the time make a mistake. Um, I mean, everyone, everyone has a 50-50 chance of being right or wrong. And so, uh, and so you take that chance. With your Rebbe, you reduce the chances. Maybe it's 75, 25, you could be right, you know. And not the Rebbe, not the Rebbe's not a fallible either, but you got no choice. You got to listen to the Rebbe. You got to do what he tells you. Um, and even if he's wrong, that's okay, because it's better listening to yourself. That's a sure you don't want to do. Uh, um, and, and you have to have that kind of confidence in your Rebbe, that your Rebbe knows who you are and what, what you're all about and what, what, what your special needs you have. And that's what's so important to establish a relationship. Establishing a relationship on a personal level requires effort, requires nagging the rabbi and uh, being a nuisance and being a pain in the neck and calling five times a day and so forth and so on. And... Uh, and uh, you know that um, uh, that uh, you shouldn't give up just because you hear my uh, my voicemail, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, uh, again, the, the idea is is that whoever it is, I mean, if you have a rabbi in, in, in your shul or, or wherever you are in your neighborhood, and you have a close connection with him, that's fine too. But you got to have somebody in your life, that's for sure. Um, and so Moshe gathers everybody together. And they all listen. And he says to them, these are the things that Hashem commanded to do them. So obviously it's an intro sentence or whatever. What's happening? On six days, work shall be done. Seven days shall be holy. They have complete rest for Shabbos. Whoever does work uh, shall be put to death. You shall not uh, um, kindle a fire in your dwellings on the Shabbos day. And so... Um, then Moshe continues to speak to the entire assembly. And what does he say? He says, uh, this is the word that Hashem has commanded. Take for yourself a portion. Once again, that truma. And um, everyone whose heart is motivated shall bring it. This again is a little different than they have shekel. This is a contribution that really is uh, out of generosity, not out of, out of obligation. In other words, if you want to have a connection with the... Um, if you want to have the obligation, uh, uh, have a uh, connection with a chairman with the shul, then you need to. Oh, you need, I'm sorry. Um, and then, and then you need to um, to to, uh, to make to make this gift. Now, this is not your membership. This is the extra gifts, extra donations you want to make out of the generosity of your heart. Uh, bring it as a gift to Hashem: gold, silver, copper, 
turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, linen, Voltaire, and so on, all the rest of the good stuff as well. It's oil for the uh, spices, for the anointment, and um, oil for the, for the incense, and uh, the shawm stones, and the settings of the breastplate, and the hay and so forth and so on. Now, it talks about the idea of, of um, giving all these gifts as a generous, as a generous donation. Uh, and um, it's really repeating what we already learned three weeks ago. So basically, the repetition means the following. That was when God said it. This is when it's being done. In other words, God said before, take blah, blah, blah. Here comes Moshe Rabbeinu, and he says, and he tells the Jewish people, this is the word. You've heard it. Let's do it. This is the parasha of getting it implemented. So it may sound similar. And you can look back to the parasha's truma if you wish. Um, on page um, 400 and, and um, uh, 440, uh, 444, I believe it is. Uh, right? 444. And there you will find the, uh, the, the it's almost the same thing. Uh, here's the portion that everyone should, uh, should uh, take um, in, uh, on 445. Gold, silver, copper, turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, linen, gold hair, dyed red skins, the stachash takash skins, the wood, the oil, the spices, the aromatic incense, aromatic incense the shawam stones, the apo, the race plate, and so forth and so on, and make a sanctuary. Why is it being repeated here? Torah says no extra words ever. The answer is to teach you that now is being done. And if we need to take an entire passage, maybe an entire paragraph, maybe an entire parsha to do that, we'll do that. The Torah will do that. Hashem will do that. To tell you how important it is to take a command and put it into action, to implement it. And so back to us on 517, we took the portions and we uh, got, got to work on it. Uh, Verse 10 on the bottom of the page, 517, every wise-hearted person amongst you shall come and make it, get, get involved, make everything that Hashem has commanded. So you might get involved in a little bit of construction work, but you've got, of course, the uh, your, your great teacher who's helping you, the architect named Betzalel. And you got the tabernacle and the tent and the cover and the hooks and the planks and the bars and the pillars and the sockets and the ark and the staves and the cover and the part, everything you got, all the, all the utensils, all the showbread, the menorah of illumination, everything, which was talked about back here, it's not being implemented over here. That's an important lesson for us to learn. That when Hashem commands to Moshe Rabbeinu, we end up doing. Uh, particularly when it comes to the Mishkan. Because the Mishkan is significant to Jewish life. And I said this again, I'll say it, and I'll say it again. Whatever we have in the grandeur and the beauty of Jewish life, if you think it is beautiful, which it is, it's half or less than half of what it really was in Eretz Yisrael. The shul is beautiful. The service is beautiful. The singing is beautiful. The chazan is beautiful. This is great. That's great. They're all marvelous, wonderful things that are happening, right? Idea is, is that, and of course, the, 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 the Torah is removed and the ark and the holiness, the beauty of it all. And all this has to be understood as, frankly, uh, uh, half of what it used to be like. And so now when you realize that, and you begin to realize and understand, what we're dealing with in terms of all these details, um, this is worthy of repeat repetition. And this is worthy of telling us that the Jews got to work on it. That's all. And of course, we said that those Jews that were involved were doing what? They were doing sort of generosity. And this is not the, not the half shekel we talked about a moment ago in the partial last week. That's not, this, not the tax, not your membership. This is generosity. And it says so. It says over there, verse 5, take yourselves a portion for Hashem, everyone whose heart motivates him. Is your heart motivated to do this? Do you want to do this? Do you want to be part of this? Some man, quite wealthy, wants to be able to give a huge donation. So huge that it will help almost nearly to build the entire building. And they'll put his name out there. Now, he, putting his name out there, of course, is you know it's a, it's a great honor, and uh, maybe uh, you, you you get all, uh, honored, and and and, uh, <laughs> and you get this you know all, all this uh, fame and whatever. But the point is, is that at the end of the day, 
we who, let's say, are building the sanctuary, building the shul, want to do it to show the people that this man is connected with Hashem. This man has made a connection. Now you make your own connection on your own level. Best I can do is I can donate this book that's worth $50, the Bible, the Torah. So what I'm going to do is in the front, I'm going to put the name, either my name, maybe the name of the loved one that I love, or that I'm honoring or memorializing so that they have the connection with Hashem. And this, of course, is voluntary. Voluntary. So that's the point of what, 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 what we want to teach over here in terms of the implementation. Generosity is what was the rule of implementation. However, oh, okay, so, 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 uh, so we're going to have a fight. You're going to give me a million dollars. And I'm going to say, okay, a million bucks. I'm going to build this beautiful shul. And I'm putting your name out there. No, 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 I don't want it. I don't want it. Well, we're going to have to fight because I want it up there. And you say, no, 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 I don't want it. And we're getting tougher and tougher with each other. And we're going to have this real fight, you know. And, you know that's, this is a kosher fight, you understand? You know, I tell the story one time I was in Israel and I was walking down Ben Yehuda Street and it started to rain. In Israel, you, you never knew, you never know what to do with the weather when they could turn on you, you know. So I'm walking down the street and it starts to rain. So I run into a store immediately and buy an umbrella. Maybe it's 30 shekels, I don't know, whatever it is, you know. And I walk out and I say to myself, wait a second. I don't remember if I paid the guy. So I walk back in the store and I say, I forgot to pay you. Says, no, 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 you paid me already. I said, no, 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 I forgot. He said, no, 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 you paid. And we get into this fight. <laughs> this is a beautiful fight. <laughs> Do you understand? That's the way Jews should be fighting all the time. As that's, a, that's the beauty of Israel. He's right about that. That's the beautiful part of Israel, of Israel and Israelis. There's beauty, there's generosity, there's caring, there's loving for, amongst us all in, in that sense. Uh, so basically, uh, we'll fight over this. But why am I so insistent that your name be up there? Maybe the, somebody don't want the honor. You're right, you're right. But why am I so insistent that it is up there? Why do I care? Because you want to get it. Say it out. Show examples to others. Show example to others. You can do what you can do on your level. This man is connected to Hashem. This man is connected to the shul. This man has his name in the shul. This man has his name in the chumash. This man has done something to connect himself with the beauty and the royalty of Jewish life. And that's why the contribution is so significant. And uh, that's why we'll have to fight it out. But first, give it a million bucks. No, <laughs> don't talk about it. <laughs> that's charity, it's like an undercover. No? And that's what he just said. He just said it. And if you have your name there, like. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to fight it out. We'll have to fight it. That's all you know it is. We'll have to fight it. It's, it's a beautiful fight. So, in any event, uh, this is the, one factor in the terms of implementing the. the, the uh, the building of the temple is generosity. Here's another one. Take a look at verse 10. Every wise-hearted person amongst you shall come and make everything that Hashem has commanded. What does wise-hearted mean? Well, for starters, he's not a dummy. He's smart. He knows what to do, how to do it. What does wise-hearted mean? What is wise-hearted? I thought wisdom's up here. I thought emotions are here. Huh? But, but why is Chochmah is here, not here? Why do we use this Chochmah in relation to our heart? I thought Chochmah is up here. I thought emotions over here. Why do we say wise heart? Yes, sir. Is it because you're using both the rationale and the emotion, putting it together? So then, what does it say? Wise hearted and wise hearted, wise brain. So say both of them. What do you say? No, anybody? Why do we, yes, ma'am? Okay, that's what he's saying. But I'm saying it doesn't say that. It says hard exclusively. It says wise hearted. And I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with the text, folks. Right? I, I don't make this up. That's what God writes. What does God mean by this? What does God mean that he wants? How do you become wise hearted in the eyes of God? What do you do? Love Hashem. But that's not wise. That's beautiful. 
That's good heart. Every Jew has a good heart. Every Jew wants to love Hashem. Some do more. That's correct. There's a more devoted. That's correct. But at the end of the day, where's wisdom of the heart? Let me tell you what wisdom of the heart is. Wisdom of the heart teaches you that wisdom is not in the brain at all. Wisdom is only in the heart. Because you know what wisdom is? Wisdom is not what you know. And it's not what you understand. It's wisdom is the desire to know. They're running to your Rebbe. They're running to your teacher. They're running to your class. They're running to no more. They're running and saying, I got to be on time because I'm missing information I need to know. The desire for wisdom, the desire for knowledge, the hatred of ignorance, that is a wise heart. I can't be afford to be late. Rabbi Block will say something and I'll never know it. I got I to gotta hear this. I got to hear this information. I can't, I can't forget this. It's a class? Are you kidding? Who knows what he's going to say tonight? Of course, you'll come to the class and he'll say 80%, 85% of what you already know. Except it's worth for that 15% to come. They hear something brand new for 15%. Whoa. That's worth an hour for 5%. Because you would never know again for the rest of your life. So you see the point is, what is wisdom of the heart? Wisdom of the heart is called searching for wisdom. King David passes away. King Solomon takes his, his, uh, his, his uh, throne. King Solomon, on the first night of his throne, has a dream. And in the dream, Hashem comes to him. And Hashem says to him, what do you want? You are the king of Israel. You can have anything you want. Fame, fortune, all these possessions, anything you want. Chariots, uh, anything you want. It's all yours. Uh, you can have great good health if you want. You could have uh, you can have wisdom if you want. You could have a, 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 a good heart. You can have a, a, a lots of money. You can have a lo lots of love. What do you want? And Shlomo responds and says, "I want wisdom." What is Shlomo saying? Shlomo is saying that the greatest thing in the world is to have wisdom, because wisdom and opens your eyes and enlightens you to be able to choose the right path and know what you're doing is right and getting it right and getting life right. God says to Shlomo, you're already wise. <laughs> you don't need it. You already got it. If you are seeking it, you already got it. You want wisdom? You want to go to yeshiva? You want to learn? You want to know? You already there. Not as far as knowing. You don't know it yet. But if you want to know it. My father, I remember after going to Israel for the first year of my yeshiva. So um, uh, I had changed. I became a, a little more serious about learning. Uh, I was about 17. I was very childish. And, um, and uh, because most 17 year olds are, so I don't feel so embarrassed. Um, and my father sent me there to Israel for a year to learn. I came back, he said, Whoa, change, you mature. You're this, you that, you I see a series. You open a free moment, you open up a safety, you learn this, and that. Very proud of me. And then he said to me, Well, now, son, that you really mature and gotten so put together, it's time to go to college. And I said, No, I want to go back to learn, I want to go to Yeshiva. He said, well, wait, wait a second. I mean, you know, don't you have to go to college? I said, not necessarily. I said, I want to go back to learn. So my father consulted with a friend of his, a colleague, uh, another rabbi. And he said the following words. He says, your son has developed an appreciation for higher levels of learning. And you can get higher levels in there to swell more than you can get in America. Send it. So my father sent me on a one-way ticket. <laughs> anyway, so point is, is that um, I mean, eventually I did come back. <laughs> I'm here, but but the point is, is that um, the idea of having the um, the sense of wanting to learn more uh, was uh, that's where. It really starts developing you know, every few moments. I'm, um, I'm driving from here to here on my job. I got to go to this client, that client, this client. And I don't have a radio playing. I don't have that idiotic music or the 
news, which is not news, which is all lies. What do I have? I have a tape of someone learning. I have a tape of someone teaching. I'm listening to the daf, whatever it is I'm listening to. Right? That's why I do my free moments. I love learning. I'm in love with learning. Now, a um, uh, person is uh, uh, has a free moment while he's sitting in a doctor's office. So he could be a dummy and pick up one of those trashy magazines. Every doctor's office has at least 50% of his magazines are trashy. Are, on, uh, are non-readable for religious Jews, right? No, certainly, I mean, right? I mean, you have to put on blinders to what to look at all those pictures. Anyway, so uh, uh, you have a safer with you. You have a tehillim with you. You have something meaningful because you enjoy the beauty and the, the, the excitement of gaining more knowledge. That's wisdom of the heart. That's right. That's right. I'm a Talmud all my life. I'm not a Chacham. I'm a Talmud Chacham. Brilliant. That a person aspires to be a student of wisdom all his life. You see? And that really determines how well you're going to contribute to this, to this, uh, 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 the, the event of, of, um, uh, of the Mishkan. But now I want to bring to your attention, well, this will conclude. Why is it that the parasha begins with Shabbos before it talks about the implementation of the Mishkan? Anybody? Shabbat overrides. So you can work six days on the Mishkan, but you can't work on the seventh day. Why does Shabbat override the sanctuary? Because Shabbat was created its holiness was developed by Hashem. The sanctuary was developed by us, by man. Man-made holiness does not compare to Hashem's holiness. So, so a person who's foolish will say, no, Shabbat's coming, and I really want to, uh, to, go, to, uh, to go to shul on Shabbat. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get in my car and drive to shul on Shabbat. Man. Shabbat, a shul is important. I'm, I, don't get me wrong. I go to shul every Shabbat because I also make sure to live in the right neighborhood, you know. I also make sure to live near a shul, right? I ain't so silly that I'm going to go move somewhere into Timbuktu. You understand? I guarantee there are no shuls in Timbuktu. No way. So, but, but, uh, but uh, you can't get there by driving because you're Making holy the temple, but at the expense of the Shabbat. So Shabbat overrides the temple, no doubt about it. But it overrides the temple in a more dramatic fashion. What it does is it says the following, that not only is it forbidden to construct a sanctuary on Shabbat, but it's also forbidden to do anything that was involved in the construction of the sanctuary for anything else. And we determined, the rabbis determined, that there are 39 forbidden labors that are, in fact, forbidden on Shabbos because those were the labors that were used in the construction of the sanctuary. And that's how our history comes down. That's how the teaching comes down. That's how the, 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 the whole lesson comes down of what is forbidden on Shabbos, which simply means that in order to demonstrate the superiority of Shabbos, Anything that was done in the construction of the sanctuary becomes immediately forbidden no matter what at any given time on Shabbos. That means that even if you're doing it to tie your shoes or you're doing it to, uh, 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 or, or to, to peel a cucumber, whatever it is that you're doing, is it involving any one of those 39 labors that was involved in the construction of the sanctuary becomes automatically forbidden on Shabbos as a measure of expressing, of expressing the idea that Shabbos is superior to the sanctuary. And whatever holiness we create in this world can compare with the natural holiness of God at the beginning of creation. And so, again, if you're telling them six days, you go out. Right, right, right. Seven days, you don't. Like, you're not, you can't go right. out. Right, right. But what it's saying over there is that you should not go out to earn a living. 
It doesn't say what you can and cannot do. If, as long as I'm not making a living, why can't I peel a cucumber? If I decide, I don't want, I'm, Saturday's my day off. I'm not going to work a living. I'm not going to go out there and, 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 and earn any money or take any money from Shemayim. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a drive up the mountain near the ocean and meditate with God on Shabbat. What about going to work on Shabbat without doing Malacha? How about if I walk to my job and uh, I go into the office, you understand? And I don't pick up the phone and I don't pick up a pen and I simply offer directives to my uh, workers and uh, then I go home. Is that permitted? I haven't done one violation, any one of the 39 labors. That's your question, right? Brilliant question. Am I permitted to do that? Why not? Well, what's wrong with that? I didn't do any of the 39 forbidden labors. The answer is Bashalach. The answer is Bashalach said you can't go out and earn a living. You can't go out and get your money or food that you need. You can't go out and do anything that involves business, involves Purchase involves sale, involves, uh, 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 you know, involves a, uh, uh, in, involves a transaction. How about this? How about this question? Can I, what's a transaction? I give you something, you give me a return? What happens if I give you something, you don't give me anything in return? Is that still a transaction? Why not? Why not? It's a transaction. I just gave you something, and that's all I want from you back is a smile. I don't want ten dollars. I don't want ten dollars. I don't want hundred dollars. I'm giving you this card just for a smile. So you smile back, you get the card. Is that permitted on Chavez? Why not? Because I'm making a transaction. What's wrong with a transaction? What we just said. Right? What would be the crime in a man going to the store, a drugstore, on Shabbat and not purchasing and not writing? And the guy knows who you are. He knows you're going to go back Saturday night with the 50 bucks. And he gives you the medicine right now. What's wrong with that? For that matter, what's wrong with giving the 50 bucks? I, I, did, I didn't carry. Was in, I was in an A room. What's wrong with, with, with spending 50 bucks? What's wrong with that? Kind of funny the way it shows up there. What's wrong with that? The answer is transacting a business deal of any sort is no different than going out and collecting man from heaven on Shabbat day as they were forbidden to do in the desert. So you were told on Friday to collect a double portion because in Shabbat you won't find. Now there were people who disobeyed. Everybody disobeys one time or another and they said, I'm going out on Shabbat to collect and they found nothing. But the truth is, what was their crime? The truth is, is that going out in any way to transact anything is inappropriate on Shabbat. So I ask you a question. Can I give you a gift on Shabbat? Yeah. No. Okay, friends. I'm invited to somebody's house this Shabbat for lunch. So I want to bring him a bottle of wine as a token of my friendship and gesture. Am I allowed to do that on Shabbos? No. You say yes? How many yeses? Twos. How many no's? Uh, you know, in, in this class, a very interesting class. You know, no one, no, no one votes with hands up. No one like this. Right? No one's voting like this. You know? no, no one wants to commit, right? And the answer is, so what do you say, Oba? What, what should we do? What should we do with the bottle of wine? Come before Shabbat. Okay, and you can do. It. I got a better idea. Oh, no, no, he invited you to your house. Well, if you invite him to your house, he's going to bring the wine to you. So that's not good either. What? Bring before. That's what he said. Okay, good. Here's another way. But what? Somebody? I, I accepted mentally before Shabbat. You I got a better idea. Open it yourself and then just share it. Oh. Somebody with wisdom over here of the heart. <laughs> Something under that red shirt, isn't it? <laughs> uh, the white shirt. <laughs> Your wisdom shirt. Just open it up on the table and share it with everybody. So it's not really a gift. It's really a sharing, right? So in other words, we find these kind of 
uh, loopholes or these kind of maneuvers to not to violate. Is that right or wrong to find a loophole? It's not wrong. What's, what's, what's right with it? What's right with it is that I recognize that it's forbidden and therefore I recognize that I need to make a loophole. I know I can't turn the lights off in Shabbat, so I go out to the store and buy myself a timer. Is that incorrect? I can't begin